become a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash golden era bookworm for special access to photos, articles, and rare to find books on old school bodybuilding. Hi everybody, Golden Era Bookworm here. Today we're going to look at the evolution of bodybuilding with a focus on the most important figures uh, all the way from the Bronze Era up to the Golden Era. Now the focus of these figures will be mainly on how they contributed in regards to the manufacture of certain products, be it, be it supplements or equipment or, or even magazines. Um, with, each, which, with each era and the subsequent invention of new and better equipment, for example, um, bodybuilding itself, the principles evolved and the physiques evolved even. So throughout the evolution of bodybuilding, we see the physiques got larger, not necessarily stronger, but basically things changed and evolved from strongmanism all the way to bodybuilding. Here, for example, we have one of the most earliest pioneers of bodybuilding, Eugene Sander, holding one of these very old um, globe, I don't know whether you'd call that a dumbbell or a barbell, but a very giant globe barbell. And we're going to look at his contributions as well as other very important and iconic figures of bodybuilding's history. So let's start with this. I, I think it's a very fascinating topic. Now, when we look back at the Bronze Era, which was full of these old time strongmen, as pictured here, Arthur Saxon of the Saxon Trio, um, these men, these real strong masculine men with phenomenal moustaches, by the way, um, were well known for their feats of strength, um, traveling all over the, the world and, and wowing uh, the audiences and, and filling in all these um, pub halls and, and auditoriums and, and, and basically causing these phenomenal shows. And um, back then there was no weightlifting or bodybuilding, of course. There were odd lifts and demonstrations of incredible human strength. These guys were true superhumans and natural. Um, which kind of relates to a recent topic that's been floating around, how strong men should um, not be drug testers. I, I, I don't believe that's uh, necessarily true. I think they should be, but that's another topic. Uh, when you look at strong men of the past, these guys took nothing. They were naturally strong, and I would, I would dare to say, as strong and in some things stronger than the men nowadays just because um, they were built that way and, and they just did things that we don't do nowadays. A lot of these strongman acts are just not done anymore and they do build um, phenomenal strength, superhuman strength. In, uh, figures of importance were obviously Eugene Sandow, uh, Professor Attila, his mentor, uh, Louis Sir, and the Saxon brothers. These guys live on in history as true iconic figures. Now, Eugene Sandow, as I mentioned earlier, was one of the pioneers of bodybuilding. And to many, he is considered the father of progressive resistance training. As mentioned in many of his books, some of which I've read, um, he was more consent, concerned with the health of the people over their ability to be strong. We are talking about right now the Bronze Era, so and just before the Silver Era. Uh, so we're talking around the 19, the early 1900s, probably around the 1920s. Um, at, at, that, at that time in history, he already was concerned with the health of people. He saw a decline in their ability to do things in everyday life, otherwise known as fitness. There was a decline in fitness. And we are talking of an age where technology was not as advanced as it is today. And it really does go to show how, um, how we've declined as a civilization. He was concerned with their health and so began to commercially produce adjustable dumbbells and barbells. Not necessarily like the one he's holding right now, which were more um, for strongman shows, but he actually created very small dumbbells uh, that he would sell with courses. And these, by the way, were the very first bodybuilding courses that I'm, uh, that I'm aware of. And he also sold a home gym, uh, a style of equipment that basically is just a steel cable an adjustable steel cable that would allow you to perform exercises for the whole body, again, with courses. And again, so Eugene Sandow, when we look at him as a pioneer of bodybuilding, we can say that he was one of the first men to ever not just concern himself with the health of people, but supply commercially available equipment for home gym use. And in, in that respect, he really started off 
a big business, a big business that was going to proliferate with time. Now, the types of physiques that would come from the use of his home gym equipment, uh, men would, would boast only 14 inch arms and 42 inch chests. Of course, nothing as impressive as today's athletes. Of course, today's athletes, many of them are enhanced, but even us normal gym goers, obviously 14 inch arms and 42 inch chests are nothing to be, uh, it's nothing impressive. But there is one thing though, these, um, these home gym equipment did still produce um, a much better lifestyle for, for people back in the day. They were obviously not as strong as the strong men were, but this was the first step towards um, bodybuilding and the, the true beginnings of the evolution of bodybuilding as we know it today. Now, the second most important figure to me in the evolution of bodybuilding has to be Alan Calvert, who founded the Milo Barbell Company in the year 1902. He also, just like, just like Sandow, who really provided the basis for the Milo Barbell um, that was to come along. He, uh, so Alan Calvert created the adjustable barbell uh, based on, Sam's, uh, on Sandow's invention. Um, similarly, you could also fill it up, and here's a great ad there showing the Milo adjustable barbell. The course of, as well was based on Sandow's courses, and so we see a further development from what Eugene Sandow created. Um, so Sandow's methods really did serve as a basis, which Alan Calvert uh, further improved. And with his improvement came the improvement of the physique. So we see that with uh, Eugene Sandow's methods, um, the typical uh, physical culturist at the time, that's what they were called, uh, would have 14 inch arms and 42 inch chests. But with Alan Calvert's improved methods and improved equipment, we see the physiques improve further. Now the physiques have 16 inch arms and 46, 46 inch chests. And um, the Milo Com Barbell Company has to be one of the most historic um, yeah, uh, companies of all time in regards to the production of equipment and to the courses they produce. Uh, they are truly iconic when it comes to the evolution and history of bodybuilding. And now we come to George F. Jowett, who I believe is one of the greatest uh, pioneers of bodybuilding, one of my favorites. He further improved on Calvert's efforts um, with the invention of many different types of equipment, um, which may, many of you are probably not aware of. I mean, the plate-loaded dumbbell that we all use um, when, we, when we've bought our home gym equipment was based on a patent from uh, George F. Jowett, which then many people copied. And it is shown here. You can actually you could actually plate load these dumbbells and, and they are beautiful. Um, they are a beautiful piece of history I think that many people take for granted. Um, he also invented the iron shoe, which was also copied by many other companies such as uh, Wader and York, um, as well as the fulcrum lever bell. And believe it or not, George F. Jowett also was one of the first, if not the first, man to ever create a piece of exercise machinery called the seat of health. Basically, it was the first rowing machine ever created. And you could pack it up into a little suitcase. You can look it up on Google, it's pretty amazing. And these things are so hard to find now. Um, so George F. Jowett actually had a total of 60 patents when it, when it came to exercise equipment. And he really did develop, when you talk about gym equipment, he really did take it to another level with 60 patents and all these different kinds of equipment that he thought of. Um, so there was really an increase and, and a proliferation in the types of equipments that could be used. Unfortunately, um, because the courses and methods didn't develop further from Alan Calvert's, um, only the equipment did, um, physiques didn't necessarily uh, increase further in size. Um, what did happen though was George F. Jowett's contribution to weightlifting where together with, with Alan Calvert, they really did set the rules uh, for weightlifting and records uh, increased with their contributions. So um, George F. Jowett, obviously a fantastic contributor when it comes to the evolution of bodybuilding, a true icon in the history of bodybuilding. Now one relatively unheard of uh, figure of the history of bodybuilding has to be Mark Berry, which I'm pretty sure many people go, what, question mark, who is Mark Berry? Well, I think Mark Berry really did spark the beginning of the Silver Era. Um, he is 
the creator of the infamous 20 rep squat program, which led to the to the development of Herculean physiques. Hercules was born, damn it. I mean, we're talking about physiques with arms that stretch the tape at 17 to 18 inches and chests up to 48 inches, such as those of John Grimm standing right next to Mark Berry as they appeared at the 1936 Olympic Games. We're talking about physiques like Steve Reeves, Clarence Ross, Alan Steffen, and many others. They all used the 20 rep squat, and this 20 rep squat is infamous. Why? Because of the ability to grow muscle, the stimulus that it creates. Um, it is known for that reason and for that reason alone. To many, therefore, Mark Berry is a true, um, import, truly important figure because when when he developed the 20 rep squat, this was a completely new method of training. Not only did it spark the um, the training of heavy weights for high reps, which is what the 20 rep squat is. You use a heavy weight, you squat for high reps. I mean, most people weren't doing 20 reps, they were doing eight to 12. So now you're doing eight, uh, 20 reps with a heavy, heavy weight. We're talking about 300, 350, up to 400 pounds for 20 reps. The full body stimulation created by this program is incredible. And of course it led to an increase and progression in, in, in the physiques and therefore led to a new era. The physiques improved tremendously. And this is this was really truly the birth of the silver era. The physiques just skyrocketed to a whole new level. Not necessarily due to new equipment, by, but because of this new method. This new method which caused the, the growth of the body to reach Herculean proportions. Mark Berry definitely goes down as one of the um, important figures in the history and evolution of bodybuilding. Now, no history and evolution of bodybuilding conversation would be complete without talking about Bob Hoffman and Joe Wader. So Bob Hoffman, let's talk about him first. Bob Hoffman obviously um, developed, uh, created what would be considered one of the greatest weightlifting clubs in U.S. history and, the, and in the world even, and that is the York, um, the York Weightlifting Club. Um, uh, Bob Hoffman was uh, unfortunately the, the type of person that shunned bodybuilding with his AAU contests, that is his weightlifting meets, um, having the bodybuilding contests after the weightlifting meets. Um, he was mainly therefore a promoter of weightlifting and put bodybuilding aside. Also important is his contribution, uh, I, I have to say obviously a negative contribution in that he introduced testosterone and dianabol to the US in the mid 50s. Um, in the mid 50s, it is known that Bob Hoffman introduced testosterone, for example, to John Grimmick, uh, to I believe uh, two other bodybuilders. I've, I, I've already done a video which I've linked, uh, which I will link above right now. But um, basically, he introduced testosterone after finding out that the Russian weightlifting team was using it uh, to enhance their athletes. And um, although they found it a rather dangerous practice, they switched to Dianabol in the late 50s. And of course, the rest is history. This led to the increased development of the physiques. And now you had bodybuilders stretching the tape with their arms from 19 to 20 inches and 56 to 60 inch chests. I mean, we are talking about now the beginning of the golden era. And now when we come to the golden era, we can't talk about the golden era without talking about Joe Wader. Of course, Joe Wader further developed bodybuilding principles. It is said that he studied Sandow's methods and Alan Calvert's methods, and he spoke to George Jowett uh, and Mark Berry, and realizing that bodybuilding itself could be further developed and improved, he improved on the Milo courses. And um, not just that, but he created the IFBB, which allowed bodybuilders to steer away from the AAU. Joe Wader felt that the AAU was not giving sufficient coverage to bodybuilding. And as I mentioned earlier, Hoffman did side with the weightlifters. He thought that weightlifting was greater than bodybuilding, whereas Joe Wader had the opposite effect. And this, of course, caused a war, a war between them. Um, the Wader principles were born. And um, of course, with the 
way the principles being displayed in the magazines along with these phenomenal physiques um, people started buying the magazines the supplements equipment I mean I, I remember as a, as, a, as a kid going to the shops and I couldn't wait for the magazines to come out and I'm talking about the 80s and 90s and uh, yeah he created his bodybuilding empire and of course when he created the IFBB he not only created the IFBB for bodybuilders but then he tried to really take over by creating the Mr. Olympia. Truly Joe Wader. If it wasn't for him, I guess bodybuilding would not be where it is today. I don't necessarily think that he is the world's greatest builder of virile men, of virile he-men, but definitely without Joe Wader's uh, influence, bodybuilding would not have evolved to what it has today. Now with the golden era, we have other very iconic figures such as Piri Raider, who wrote Iron Man magazine until the mid 80s and I believe it's probably the best magazine that was ever written in bodybuilding. We also have Vince Gironda, Vince Gironda with his most radical methods such as the 36 eggs diet and many other things. Of course the, the main thing that I loved about Vince was that he was so focused on aesthetics over mass and um, his methods could obviously not be argued against when he produced Mr. Olympias such as Larry Scott. We also have Dan Lurie who created Muscle Training Illustrated and a competitive um, a competitive association of bodybuilding such as the WBBG uh, uh, with the Mr. Olympus contest which uh, Sergio Oliva um, entered and won many times and uh, also caused a real, a real spark against the waders at the time. Very important figures of course in the evolution of bodybuilding. So I hope you've enjoyed this video on the evolution of bodybuilding with the focus on the pioneers and the most iconic figures um, with, their f with the focus on their creations, on their inventions and how it shaped bodybuilding to what it is today. Um, I leave you with the, with the Sandow statue, the Sandow bronze statue, a real representation of what bodybuilding was, of what it was and what it should be, physical culture. I really think that um, with the golden era, we had the we had the sprouting of better developed physiques, but at the cost of health, because anabolic steroids came into the scene. My favorite period has to be the bronze and silver era, where strength, health, and beauty were all synchronized into a beautiful art called physical culture. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't to the Golden Era Bookworm. Leave me a comment and thank you for watching. If you'd like to donate, please visit PayPal. And um, I've linked the description below uh, to my uh, PayPal details. Uh, you can also join my Patreon account for exclusive access to photos, magazine articles, and hard-to-find books. This is the Golden Era Bookworm. Bye for now.